Hey, what's up, people, and welcome back to The Weekly D. Today, I have the amazing Leslie Lyons on with me, and Leslie and I are going to be talking about all things business. So if you're a studio owner, this podcast is going to be super valuable to you, but this will be just as interesting for students to listen to. So if you are a studio owner or an entrepreneur or someone looking to run their own business, this is going to be a very, very interesting podcast for you to listen to. So without further ado, this is the weekly D. Because honey, if you ain't getting your D on the daily, then you better at least be getting it once on the weekly. If you're not getting any and you want some tea, then come and join them up on the weekly D. It's the weekly D. Leslie, thank you for joining me on my podcast. I'm so appreciative to have you here. I've obviously done your podcast before, so it's so nice to have you on mine. Thank you for joining me. How are you? Oh, Dan, I'm super excited. Exactly. I'm like, you came and did my podcast. How could I tell you no? And how and, how long ago was that? Can you remember? Oh, it was about two years ago. It was pre-COVID, right? No, oh, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. That's well, crazy. Maybe three years ago. Maybe. Yeah. God, that's crazy. Well, it's so nice to have you here. Now, I literally, before I start, I have to just ask this question. Obviously, I know you as Leslie Lyons, but I also know you as Sydney Seymour. So can you just, which is your real name? Which one is Leslie Lyons your real name? Yes, Leslie Lyons is my real name. So quick story about the Sydney Seymour name, okay. which will also get some of my background. So when I started Pole as a business, I was also working full time as a youth minister in a church, in a mega church here. Ah. And my pastor did not care. But it started some rumblings in the congregation, like, she's going to touch my daughter and she's going to get a lap dance anointing. I don't know if I want that to happen. So he was like, look, I'm not going to tell you to stop your business, but what could we do to separate you at church, working for the church, and you swinging around poles at night? <sighs> so the Sydney Seymour came up out of that. I then I see. also did a little bit of burlesque performance, so that became my burlesque name and all of that fun stuff. But that's the story of why. Right. The Sydney well, do you know what? That literally leads me on to one of the first things I wanted to talk to you about. Um, so obviously you are a woman of the Lord. You you make no qualms about it. You are, of course. Um, how did um how did obviously your pole career and stuff go down? with not only just the church, but even like family, friends? Has has it ever given you any problems? No, it has not. And I think a lot of it had to do with because of how I present myself as a person. Yeah. And so the people who knew me, now my dad, when this is kind of funny, he had to help install my home pole for me to practice. And so my husband, it was one of those 50 millimeter brass poles, (laughs) one piece, you don't remove it. You drill it in the floor. You drill it in the ceiling. That's uh-huh. how long ago that was. Wow. And wow. my husband needed help getting it installed. So he went and got my father. My father lived down the street from us at that time. <laughs> my father came in, staunch Christian, but didn't say anything. Just helping his son-in-law get it up. Didn't say anything the whole time. Oh. But he went back home to my mother and was like, what is your daughter over there doing? Is she going to be a fat stripper? Is that what she's doing? <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. So you've never you've never come into any problems with it, which is good. I mean, I'm sure people had thoughts about it, mm. but for luckily for me, because I am so open, I am truly an open book. People would just ask, what's up with that? Like my dad, like, is she getting ready to try to be a fat stripper? Like, what's going on? And people would ask, and I would just simply tell them, you know. This is what I'm doing. This is why I'm doing it. I didn't get a lot of heat. No. And you would think because when people talk about the patriarchy, I'm always like, I'm an expert on the patriarchy. (laughs) I am steeped in religiosity (laughs) all the time. So if anything, people think it would have been a big deal, but honestly, it really wasn't. I think because people knew who I was. Right. Right. I get you. And they were just like, I don't understand that pole shit. Like 70 year old black church mothers, they're like, I don't understand that pole shit. But look, she done lost a little bit of weight. 
Amazing. That's what they were like. So yeah. So no, it wasn't a big deal for me. It I know it has been for others, but it wasn't for me. Fair enough. So, uh, sorry, I kind of did that a little bit backwards, but I thought whilst we were on the subject, let's just talk about it. So, obviously, for those of you uh, who are listening to this right now and don't know who Leslie is, Leslie is a uh, business coach for specifically really for Pole Studios, right? Or do you venture outside of Pole Studios as well and help other business women? You do. Yeah, I do. So, primarily, I'm a sales trainer. And, but however, inside of the our industry, I am a true business strategist. Right. Because I don't just coach. I give them strategy too. So yeah, within the pole industry, you hit it right on the head. Yeah. I've got a whole corporate side to my business, a speaking side. Mm-hmm. But for the purposes mm-hmm. of this, yeah, that's what I do. And what is, um? so let's go back a little bit. So where mm-hmm. did your kind of entrepreneurial journey start? Was it with your first pole studio? No. Oh, no, it wasn't? No, it was not. No, gosh, no. Um, my, yeah, no. <laughs> I'm like, I was selling stuff when I was in seventh grade. So oh, amazing. Yeah, I've had an entrepreneurial spirit for a long time. My very first profitable business, how about I start there? Yeah, perfect. I was selling things that go buzz in the night. I was the sex toy lady. I was selling dildos. Yeah, I saw that. <laughs> And I had built a pretty good business. That was my first six-figure business. And so um, that was my first business. But it was not a brick-and-mortar business. I never opened a toy store. Mm -hmm. I did parties. And so I built a company that did parties. And so I had about, mm, I think at one point, like 120 reps that I had up under me selling in different states kind of a thing. So, yeah, we were selling dildos. We were slanging dicks. Okay, yeah. So... (laughs) Amazing. That was my first business, which was actually my introduction into pole. And did you so, did you sell that business or did it just? No, I closed it. Okay. I closed it. Yeah, I just closed it. Okay. And I closed it because of my pole business. Okay. So um, it was funny. One of the ways that that business was built, it was a multi-level marketing business. I just happened to be the multi-level marketer, it, but the model was the same. Okay. So I brought in reps under me. They got a commission to sell if they brought in other people, that whole market, but it was just me doing right. it. Mm-hmm. And I used to go into these mommy blogs. So they, these online blog spaces and we would be in these chat rooms and trying to recruit reps was my purpose in being there. Right. And right. one day, a woman popped up from Canada and she was like, we're doing in-home pole parties. I'm like, pole parties? What the hell is she talking about? (laughs) And, but it was obviously sexual in nature because it was a pole, even though they tried to sanitize it and make it very wholesome. Mm -hmm. But I was like, like a stripper pole? And she was like, yeah, we don't call it that. I went into all of that. And I was like, wow, I'm interested. Mm. Let me talk to you. So she actually got the CEO on the phone with me and we had a conversation, but quickly because of my business acumen and experience, I knew that his model was flawed. Right. I was like, yeah, because they were trying to sell $20,000 franchises. Wow. And my question, Dan, was what's going to stop cinnamon honey buns from coming down off of a pole and offering the exact same thing next door to me? Right. Your franchise means nothing to me. Mm-hmm. I'm not paying 20 grand. I didn't have 20 grand to give. And so I surely wasn't going to try and scrape it up to do that. So, but the thought had been planted in my heart. Right. I was like, could I do this? So long story short, after that conversation, not even three weeks later, he called me back and said, I thought about what you said, because I told him, I said, this is flawed. This doesn't work. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense for me. Mm-hmm. He was like, what if we did this? And it was basically a much lower cost. I think it was like $500 for the training. Okay. And then you had to buy your pole. Okay. So maybe all in a thousand dollars in terms of investment. Bit more reasonable. A, a lot more reasonable, right? <laughs> um, they had partnered with Fanya to do uh, okay. their DVDs. Okay, so that's how we got our training. Oh, it was we that got... company she did the DVDs with. I actually was at someone's house the other day and she was like, oh my God, look, these are the DVDs I bought from years ago. I was like, oh my God, that's Fornia. <laughs> that is the so The company was called Whole Lot of Fun. Yeah, wow, it was called Whole Lot of Fun. crazy. 
Yeah. And so Fanya was the primary pole instructor for them. And so we got a couple of DVDs. I got a real cheesy one called Salsa Pole. Like it was the cheesiest thing you've ever seen in your life. (laughs) But let me tell you what it was. I don't know how much you know about sex toys, but when you sell sex toys at a, through a party, on average, I made about $400 and I was there like four hours. Right. It could be longer right. than that. Well, when I started bringing this damn pole and all I had was one spin, because I've never been a little girl child. I had one spin, a fireman spin, and bitches were amazed. They were like, God damn it. <sighs> Do you see her on this pole? Like, and I was charging $400 for an hour and a half. Wow. Amazing. So quickly, I was like, dildos by hello pole. This is all I'm doing. So yeah, that's Did actually you, how I got what, started. What made you decide to not blend the two together? I did for a while, oh, but okay. it, for me, I've always looked at thing from, things from a money perspective, like right. what makes sense monetarily. Mm-hmm. The pole was clearly eclipsing the sex toy party stuff. Right. And everybody and their mother was doing sex toy parties then. Mm-hmm. I think mm-hmm. I was one of three people in the entire state of Illinois that was offering pole parties. Right. And I, I was see. definitely the only black woman okay. that was offering pole parties. Without a shadow of a doubt, I was mm-hmm. the first black woman in our in the Midwest to be offering any type of pole, anything for everyday women. So Amazing. it made no sense for me to slang dildos anymore. I was right. like, this is where it's at. Mm-hmm. And were you um, one of the first black women to set up a pole studio where you live? Or did some... Okay, I was going to say, did some bitch beat you to it? Who was it? <laughs> Absolutely not. I was not the first studio in Illinois. The very first studio. So do, how deep you want to get? You want history? On yeah, this? come on. We need the history. We need. I think it's so I'm important sure. to know because I think it really speaks a, a testament to what, what you're doing now. So like, it just gives people more of a background to be like, where did... Where did you come from and like how did you learn all the things that you know now? Do you know what I mean? So even yeah. just little things like running the dildo parties and stuff and then moving to pole parties, then moving to a pole studio. I think it's super important because especially for people who are listening to this and are like, I want to own my own pole studio. I think it gives the clear picture. So I think it's super important. So yeah, please give me give me that history. Okay. I need to hear it. Yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> So, um, Sheila Kelly, who owns the S Factor brand. I was like, why do I recognize that name? I'm just running. Yeah, it's the Strip Down, Rise Up documentary, all of that, right? Yeah. Well, when she first started, she was teaching out of her garage in LA. Then she opened a small studio in LA. Well, she wanted to branch out. So her approach to branching out was not to franchise. I'm not going to comment on that. But her approach to branch out was to approach existing yoga studios with this new modality. So here in Illinois, she approached a yoga studio on the north side called the Red Door. And the Red Door, so essentially, I'm just going to say it because it's true, it's it's a fact. Um, Essentially, Sheila came to these different yoga studios. It was here in Illinois, it was one in Seattle, um... I can't think of all the other places, but essentially she was like, Hey, I'm going to teach you guys these pole things. And then you're going to become an S factor studio. And this is how I'm going to expand my brand. Okay. Well, she decided she'd do it herself, like halfway through that process. And then she started suing every studio that she had trained on her method. Suing them for what? Um, co- intellectual property infringement because they were then using her idea to make money kind of thing okay even though she had invited them into that that's so odd and it wasn't a franchise you just said no it would be an illegal franchise that was the part i wasn't going to leave out right but okay <laughs> she started suing the people who she had trained this is documented you can those studio owners still exist you could talk to them And so um, the Red Door had to strip itself of all of the S-Factor names because she was opening an S-Factor studio soon. So the very first studio in the Midwest was the Red Door. Right, okay. Super small, three poles, very tiny. 
Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. then after that, after she, because she couldn't fight you. <laughs> she's an actress. She's on that show, The Good Doctor. She's married to the producer of that show. He's the star, okay? okay. But so she was always in that that realm. So my point is she had resources. This poor yoga studio owner did not. To fight. Okay. Mm-hmm. So long story short, though, there were other people, Mary Ellen Wiseman being one of them, mm-hmm. what, who was a student at that place called the Red Door. Right. So after the Red Door was closed, Mary Ellen opened a studio. She was the first studio in our area to open. She was in a house. She had like three poles in like a living room. It was mm-hmm. a commercial space, but it was a home that okay. had been turned into a commercial space in the hood. So she was first. I found Mary Ellen because of my pole out of fun. Right. People were like, okay, I had been doing that now probably about seven months. And people were booking me over and over again. It was like, okay, now we you wowed us with that fire, Miss Ben. What the fuck else you gonna show me now? Yeah. This is my third party with you. Like and I'm like, uh I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> right and so that's when i left pole out of fun because i don't know what happened between them and fanya but there was no more training okay it was like this is what you teach this is what you get so i found mary ellen after seeing sheila kelly on oprah and all of that mm-hmm. so i took two mm-hmm. sessions with mary ellen and i learned two more spins and that was <laughs> i was like that's all i need I'm back. yeah <laughs> yeah give me a little bit more content and then i'm back <laughs> I'm back, y'all. I got new stuff. Y'all ready? <laughs> and now it's going to cost you $450. So um, I did that parties alone for about a year and a half. Mm-hmm. And then a friend of mine who had been doing parties through Pull Out of Fun in Modesto, California, was like, I'm opening a studio and you should too. Right. And I was like, what? <laughs> She's like, you need to open a studio. You see, it's only that one woman, Mary Ellen, who's got a space. Our styles were very different, mm-hmm. just off the rip. She's like, you need to open a studio. So that's what I did. That's what I did. I love to tell people, I never came into this for the love of old. I came into this because I love money. Right. And and yeah, well, listen, I don't, I don't, you don't have to laugh. I, I love that you're, the one thing that I love so much about you is how honest you are about how, you know, making money is okay. And I hate that, you know, and this is something I want to talk about later down the line, but I, um, I think it's really sad how some people don't want to talk about money and they don't want to be proud that they're making good money. And it's almost like when they are making good money, they don't want to talk about it because they don't want people to take it away from them. It's like, I think we should be able to celebrate that you've done so well. Like, I, I just, I don't know where that comes from. And I'm going to ask you about that again later. But okay. so your, that was your first ever studio. And did you sell that studio or did, is that no. what you still oh, have now? Yes, it became Bombshell. So yes, Bombshell was sold. So when I first opened, the name of our business was Curvy Diva Fitness because I'm curvy. Yes. And I'm a diva. Okay. <laughs> perfect so, name. Perfect name. Perfect. Right. Right. But um, I've shared the story on my podcast about not understanding who I was in Mm -hmm. my business and truly what made me different other than being black and plus size. Right. That was not enough to differentiate me from then. So I told you about Mary Ellen, Sheila Kelly. I told you about her history. Well, Mm -hmm. she then opened a studio in Chicago. But the big name in our area that opened up after us was Flirty Girl Fitness. It was a $2.5 million investment into a space. Flirty Girl, why is that? No, no, hold on. I was about to say, is that Ashley Fox? No, what's her studio called? That's Foxy Fitness, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> and then Foxy. she's and she's nowhere near Chicago, right? Where is she? Oh, she was never in Chicago. Yeah. I think she's on the East Coast. I was like, yeah. wait, who is that? So who is it who owns that studio? Oh, well, used to own it. It was two sisters. Um, I can't remember both of their names, but Carrie Nee was one of them. Okay. Um, but they got started in um, Canada, Toronto, if I'm not mistaken. Right. And they were backed by NHL wives, so hockey wives. So that's where the money and came from. Mm-hmm. I see. Mm-hmm. Okay. So when they came to Chicago, they pulled on those networks. Their grand opening, when I went to their grand opening, 
there were football players there galore, hockey players there galore, because those were their investors. Right. And yeah, and it was the most gorgeous studio to this date. I have not seen a studio more gorgeous. Um, it was probably about 9,000 square feet. They had a licensed bar, so they had a liquor license. Um, crystal chandeliers, like it was, wow. it was a $2.5 million build out. Wow. And it still exists or no? No, they're out of business. Oh, they're out of business, wow. but I'm still here. Yeah, well. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, by that time, we had all these competitors. I didn't know who I was in the marketplace, all of that shit. And so we switched our name to Bombshell. Mm-hmm. Oh, this is a, I don't think I've ever told this story publicly. Oh, exclusive scoop. You, I love it. Yes, you can get some Give us that scoop. tea. Come on. We want to hear it. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I've told this story publicly, like, in something like this, but- <laughs> So we were Kirby Diva Fitness. And the reason we changed our name was because I actually had these three racist students who, because you have to remember, well, you don't know Chicago, but I was in a rural area and the only black faces in our studio were myself and my sister who started the business with me, the studio with me. Right. Okay. Everybody else was white. And this was redneck, redneck white. Let me be very clear. This was redneck white. Okay. Okay. And while they aren't racist, like I'm going to burn a cross on your front lawn, Mm -hmm. their daddy might, if that gives you content, their daddy might, they would not. And I was the only option, right? So they wanted to learn pole dancing. It was me and Mary Ellen and I was closer and I had better branding. So people knew about me because if they would have known about her, they probably would have went to her. That was kind of the vibe behind them. Right. So, um, Anywho, I kicked these three girls out and they went ham. Like they reported me to every agency that they could report me to. Wow. From sales tax evasion to the attorney general's office, like anything, the fire department for fire code violations. It was insane. Every day that I drove up to my studio, there was a new notice on the door from some agency that has stopped by. God. It was crazy. They had, so this was the day, this was well before Yelp and Google reviews. These heifers had went out and started making blog posts about how bad our studio was. God. It was crazy. So the slander which one is slander? Is it liable? Which one is in writing? <laughs> I think it's liable that's in writing. Maybe. Um, the liable um, made me change the name. Okay. That's why I changed the name. Right. Because it was just, it was ridiculous. It was everywhere. That's crazy. And so I changed the name to Bombshell. And th- did you do it as like a whole rebranding so that you literally had to change everything? All right, fair enough. So you wouldn't even find stuff about the old business anymore after that point? Well, I'm sure they would, but you wouldn't associate the two. Okay, I see. And right, so that was your that was still the first studio, wasn't it? And you opened up mm-hmm. other studios from there, did you, or did you? No. So essentially, what I did was so Bombshell became the brand. Okay, I stuck with that. We obviously moved to a much larger location than what we were. We moved to the city of Chicago proper. Um, and then just what, two years ago, I opened my second brand, which is Smolder, and that is a party only studio. Oh, I see. Okay. Oh, so your studios are party only studios. The, the Smolder studios are. Smolder is. I mm-hmm. see. Okay. Mm-hmm. So how many studios are we left with on. now? How many are there left? So I only have one now because I sold Bombshell, what, four months ago. Oh, okay. Well, congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> and um, how does it feel to have like sold a business? Is it Was it sad or was it just like end of an era type thing or? Or sad? <laughs> Did you say sad, Dan? <laughs> well, were you not like, oh, I have lots of memories of this or were you like, bye? <laughs> Seriously, Dan, I, I'm very clear that I was monetarily invested in mm-hmm. what I did. So for me, my goal was always to build an asset that okay. would be sold. That was my goal. Yeah. Probably year three into my business when I had really figured some shit out, I would build an asset to be sold. 
that was my goal. Okay. So yes, of course there's memories. Yes, of course yeah. there's the nostalgia of it. But you know what's better? A wire hitting your account. Oh yeah, I bet. <laughs> so obviously You know, like... there's several hundred thousands of dollars hitting your account. That that takes away a whole lot of the whining and crying. I'm sure it does. So obviously yeah. this um this entrepreneurial like spirit that you have in you to, you know, want to make successful businesses, make money. Who does this come from? Is there someone in your family who was quite entrepreneurial or was there someone that inspired you? Poverty inspired me. Oh, okay. Interesting. Tell us more about Poverty that. Poverty inspired me. Yeah, absolutely. So my dad, my mom was a stay at home mom. Okay. She went on to, to be with the Lord in 2020. She died during the pandemic. Oh, I'm sorry um, to hear that. Yeah. Thank you. And my dad was always a blue collar worker. So he was a truck driver. He was a security guard. He's and still there with were us. six of us. Yes, he is. He's still yes, with he us. Is. Okay. Yeah. That's good. Um, yes, 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 yes. Um, there were six of us. I'm the oldest of six. Okay. And we were poor. <laughs> we were poor. And, you know, it was always my dad trying to make a dollar out of 15 cents. Mm -hmm. And that lifestyle was hard. And I knew one thing that my father did in particular was he always wanted us to be smart. Like he was always on us about education. He was always on us about being better than what he was. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I just was kind of like, I can sell things. Yeah. I can convince, because when I was a child, I was a child whose mom, when she would come to get your report card, they would always blame me <laughs> for getting other girls in trouble. Right. And then I resented that as a little girl mm. because my parents were not playing with me. I get my butt whooped. I got in trouble. Right. Based off of these comments. And I remember saying to myself, I was in second grade, like, I don't make these people do anything. These people do what they want to do, but I didn't understand influence. Mm -hmm. I didn't understand leadership. I didn't understand that as a seven, eight year old girl, mm -hmm. but it was very prevalent. Then I got the report cards to prove it. Right. right? And so I always knew that I was a leader, mm -hmm. that the people would follow me. Yeah. I didn't learn later on the responsibility of leadership which is to cultivate and build other leaders. Yeah. But as a child at a very base level, I knew people would follow me. Yeah. And so I started saying, well, if I recommend this, my very first business was in seventh grade. We used to have those magazines with the little teeny bopper bands. Oh yeah. yeah. I would go buy a magazine for a dollar. I would tear out all the pictures and I would sell those for 50 cents. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> so I would take a dollar investment and make like $6 off of it. Brilliant. <laughs> kind of a thing. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. So yeah, it was my quest not to be poor that made me become entrepreneurial. So that sort of kicked it off. And then who inspires you now? So sort of like when you think of like people who you kind of look up to or really inspire you to, you know, want to keep pushing mm -hmm. yourself, who inspires you now? Yeah, probably not big names that people would know. No. Um, there are people like Tara Newman, Eleanor Beaton. Um, these are women who have built double million dollar businesses, mm -hmm. you know, like well in the millions. I think Eleanor is going into like 22 million with her company in 2023 or something like that. What does her company do? And so you, um, they're coaches. They're, they're coaches. coaches. They're business strategists. Amazing. Yeah, they're business strategists. They're consultants. Mm -hmm. um, so I spent a lot of time looking at those women who are living leaving huge footprints in the speaking teaching space. That's who I'm inspired by now. Can I ask a question? And um, sure. Are they are they both white women? Um, no, Eleanor is mixed. Okay. She's mixed. Do you think... But yes, Tara is Jewish. Oh, she yes, is. Okay. Jewish. Yeah. So mm -hmm. do you think as well that that gives you sort of a unique edge as well? Because obviously there are a lot a lot of black women also in business and probably a lot of black women that want to get into business. And do you think mm -hmm. that can give you a bit of a unique edge in terms of your sort of like sales model to be able to help black women that want to get into business? 
Um, yes and no. Okay. Part of it is the no comes from I don't work with startups anymore. Okay. I don't even in the pole business, if I get those inquiries all the time. Right. And I'm referring them out because there are other people who come into the coaching space in pole now. Y'all can have that. I'm not interested in helping people get their business started. Where I shine is are people who are already established, but need the boost. Who are ready to scale it to the next level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So that's the no part. But the yes part is absolutely. I think it gives me an advantage. Number one, my background. This is what I teach, Dan. Yeah, is like because one thing I hate about our industry is the sea of sameness. Mm -hmm. People mm -hmm. copying each other. Think about all the little bitty shit that rises up in terms of conflict. Yeah. This studio over here, they stole my curriculum. Oh, this studio over here, they stole all the verbiage off my website. They're calling their classes the same thing as my classes. Yeah. All this little bullshit. Yeah. It happens. Happens all the time. Mm. I found a studio. Well, someone sent me a studio that had taken all the pictures off our website and was using them just a couple of weeks ago. Right. It happens all the time. But I have a belief that it happens because people don't know who they are. So they try to replicate what they see as opposed to going into who they are and birth something mm. amazing. When you were on my podcast, that's why I chose you to come on my podcast. Out of all the people who were doing poll and all the people who were out there, you were the only one who I saw at that level, just break away and be like, I'm going to do something completely creative, <laughs> completely out of the box, but that's still building my personal brand. Yeah. You and Lux are the only two people that I have seen break away from the traditional pole star model and build personal brands. Yeah. That is a skill. And I wish though... And it's my goal. I'm on a mission to help these studio owners break away from the sea of sameness. Mm -hmm. In marketing, there's a thing called a blue ocean strategy. Mm -hmm. And they compare it to red ocean, blue ocean. So in a red ocean, it's where all the sharks are, right? Like they're feeding on each other and it's the blood that's in the ocean because it's just cluttered. All the sharks are in that space and it's just a bloody mess. Yeah. But a blue ocean... There is no competition there. And what creates blue oceans is what you've done. Okay. I'm like, this is going. Um, blue oceans for what you've done. Mm -hmm. And so people are very much so. <sighs> I call it a race to the bottom. Mm -hmm. When it's like. People are doing things that aren't profitable for their business. They're doing very low cost classes. They're doing, you know, I don't want to be different. I want to be the same as the studio down the street. Mm -hmm. Like that type of stuff, I'm on a mission to eradicate. Right. Why, where do you think that's come from, though? Why do you think so many of the studios all, do you think it's a, they see success, so they want to copy the success rather than create their own success? Do you think that's where Absolutely, it comes from? Absolutely, because that's Absolutely. That was what it was for me mm. when I first started out, you know, um, I was looking, even though I opened before Flirty Girl and S Factor, I still was looking at the success they were having because I wasn't having that success. Right. And started to try to model myself after them, mm -hmm. which was the kiss of death for my business. Yeah. It wasn't until I did a soulful search of who I was and what I was bringing to the market that I started to make money. Right. So yes, I want to normalize that it is new, especially if you're a business owner who's never had any other type of business, to look and say, well, what's working for other people? I don't need to reinvent the wheel. Let me just copy what I see. Right. But you do yourself and our industry such a disservice mm -hmm. when you do that. So now I've done a couple of things on my Instagram page where newer studio owners will pop on. I won't work with them, but I will use you as a case study if you want to pop on. And my very first question to them is, great, what are you going to bring to the industry that does not already exist? Right. 
And what, what's, want to open a studio? Fantastic. What's generally the answer to that? What What do most of them end up saying? Uh, well, <laughs> my least favorite answer in the world is how I teach. <laughs> Uh, we're technical because everybody and their mother thinks that they are the best pole dance teacher in the world. And mm. the one down the street is just horrible. Like this has been going on in our industry forever. So studio owners who are listening to this, if your great marketing advantage, if your unique selling proposition to use marketing terms is that you teach safe pole, stop it. <laughs> stop it. Because even the studio that doesn't teach safe pole, do you think they're advertising that they don't? Of course they don't. Nice. Safe pole means nothing to anybody who hasn't been injured. Of course. <laughs> so that's what they tell me. It's always something about technique. Nine times out of 10, now that I'm thinking about it, it's, they usually bring up something about their teaching style, technique. And I'm just like, that is such a base level. Yeah. Thing to market on. Or they'll talk about the classes they offer. Any class you offer, I could, I could offer tomorrow. Yeah. Seriously. Mm. I talked to Carmine. I'm sure you know who Carmine is. Yeah, of course. I talked to Carmine quite a bit. And one of the things that happens a lot is people come and taking her classes and then just replicating her prompts. Yeah. <laughs> replicating the choreography she t- she taught. Mm. Like that happens a lot and it's irritating as fuck. It is irritating as fuck. It's so difficult, but at the same time, do you, see, I, yeah, see, I have a, a bit of a different view on that only because when it comes to things like choreography and obviously if mm-hmm. you're going to straight copy a choreography, I don't agree with that. But there's so much that we yeah. do in our industry that it is going to be similar. Do you know what I mean? There's going to be similarities. And obviously, if you're going to teach something, the cues might be the same. Do you know what I mean? So it's like, yeah, but it's something you... it's what you're talking about, Dan is nobody owns a fireman's bed. Correct. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we're not talking about that. But if my intellectual property, and I'm just going to use Carmine as an example, mm. her prompts are prompts that come from her soul. Mm-hmm. There's there's no course on prompts. There's courses on teaching fireman's beds. Elevated, expert. I don't know what's big in the UK. I think it's expert. expert yeah, big in the expert, UK. Spin City, yeah. Spin City, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, that's one thing. No one owns a fireman's bed. But when you start tapping into my IP, it would be like me with the Susan bit. Yeah. And now I just call her Rakisha. Yeah. That's your intellectual property that I have no right to duplicate. Mm-hmm. Your choreography, five, six, seven, eight, is your IP. Mm hmm. And this is what we're talking about. Yeah. We're not talking about moves because you're absolutely right. Yeah. But when you take someone's intellectual property and repackage it as your own, hear me tell you, you are a thief. (laughs) Yeah. But there's so many people doing it in our industry as well. Do you think that's a problem that is faced in so many different industries? I assume it's not just our Mm -hmm. industry that we face this. Obviously, Carmine is one of the few people that actually speaks up about it. But I assume there's lots of people that also suffer with the same problems that she suffers with. Um, And actually it's funny because this does kind of lead me a little bit, like segue a little bit into what I wanted to ask you afterwards. But do you think this is a, because it's a female space, it can be quite girl on girl, like she's doing better than me and I have to try and do this and I want to replicate what she's got. And it can be, I don't like to say bitchy because I don't want it to sound like, oh, all girls are bitches because obviously it's not that at all. Mm -hmm. But you know how it can Mm -hmm. be a bit catty sometimes and it can be like Mm -hmm. people have seen her success, for example, Carmine's success in the fact that she has been quite true to herself and her brand and her style. And um, and people want people want a bit of that. Do you know what I mean? Uh, But then you've also got Mm -hmm. the people who say, well, because obviously Carmine's um, main selling point is her her unique style, right? Her edge work, her, yes. you know, the, the stuff that she mm-hmm. does with her feet in the, like her shoes and stuff and the way she moves her body. Um, and I've seen the argument that, you know, there's lots of people doing that style. But obviously, how do we know who, who starts a style? Do you know what I mean? It's so difficult to say. So when people are like, well, Carmine started it, it's like, and then someone will be like, no, she didn't start it. I saw Rachel, is it? 
Rachel Rivera? Rivera. Yeah, Rachel Rivera, Rivera doing it first. It's like, yeah, mm-hmm. but, you know, we all try to create our own unique tweak to it. You know, is, does that mean it's copied? I don't know. I mean, what do you think? Um, when it comes to moves, no one un- owns an undulation either, mm. right? What I thought I made it clear, so I'll state it again. Like prompts. When you the say you when you say prompts, words. what what do you mean? Because uh, do you mean like verbal oh, yeah, cues? So... Just because we maybe call it something different here. So do you yeah, mean like because obviously like when I teach a chair spin, I'll be like, okay, arm here, arm here, and I'll teach them where I want their body and stuff, and I call that like a verbal cue. Is are you saying prompts? Same. Okay. No, I'm not. Oh, so sorry. Okay, so that was totally yeah. where I was getting confused. This is why I kept bringing it up because. <laughs> That's uh, that's what I yeah, thought you were trying to say. Okay, so what's so what is it you're t- talking about? Yeah, so prompts are often used in free dance to help a mover go deeper into their movement. Right. So a prompt right. is a verbal cue with a story. Okay. Can you give me an example? So, yeah, absolutely. So a good prompt, a, an example of a movement prompt, is a visualization. So you might have seen people do things like envision that you're frozen. Right. And you're just starting to thaw out. Ah. Show me what that would look like in your body going from, from winter to spring. Right. Oh, Show I see. Me. This right, is, okay, so, this uh, is why I was getting so confused because I was like, well, surely she's still going to have to prompt the same arm. Okay, oh, I get yeah. you, I get you, I get you. Okay, yeah, and obviously yeah, so that Q- is so individual. Absolutely. Yes, and so what I'm talking about is visualization prompts, things that take dancers into deeper exploration of their movement. Mm-hmm. Oftentimes, when I was teaching, those prompts came from my soul. They came from things that I saw. They came from thought. They came from experience. Yeah. It came from my life and it gave my students the gift of expansive movement. Mm-hmm. That is my IP. Yeah. I see. You can't come to my class and then you go back to Dan class and let's talk about this frozen prompt as an example. Okay. That's IP that's being stolen. So... Say, for example, I'm a studio comes to you and says, listen, I need your help. I feel like my studio has no IP. Like, how can I create this? And, you know, what? how do you help people find their IP? Without obviously giving too much away, because obviously people got to pay for that stuff. But, you know, just a rough guy. Like, so like, what sort of things do you help people do in, in finding their IP? Yeah, absolutely. So I believe that every single person comes genetically coded with specific gifts. Mm -hmm. I believe that at the core of me. So I often talk about in my work, finding your soulful values. It's like your soul's fingerprints. Once you can find out who you are and what you were actually birthed to do, your IP flows from that. Right. We can all be teaching the same thing, but our stories are different. Yeah. Why we do what are what we do are different. Mm-hmm. So the first thing I want to help you do as a business owner is figure out the why behind what you do, and that informs everything else from your branding to what you teach in your classes. Right. What I am big on with studios in particular is them having signature programming. Mm-hmm. So something that is unique that is birthed out of your experiences and who you are. Right. So there's a process that I take you through. It's essentially an assessment that I use to start with. And we start with what are those genetically coded values? It's a blend of two systems, the Enneagram, which is more of a spiritual esoteric system, and then a program that was developed by Sally Hogshead called Fascinate. I use those two tools and I've blended them together to come up with my framework for soulful values. And that's where we start, getting crystal clear on who you are and what makes you different. Mm -hmm. Different is better than better. And what... um, So when we talk... Oh, go on. Sorry, Karen, what were you going to say? No, I was going to say, when we talk about cattiness, because you made mention to that, like, I'm better than her, I'm better than him, I'm better than them, Mm. right? 
that energy, people will get, people can always catch you. This is what I tell people. Like, there's nothing you're doing from a pole. I don't care who you are. Right. You could be the best pole dancer in the world. There is nothing you're doing that someone else can't learn to do. Mm -hmm. All it takes is practice. You're training people to do it now. What the hell are you talking about? Like, there's nothing from a technical standpoint that can't be learned. Hence, duplicate. But what I can't duplicate is who you are in your story. Yeah. When you realize that, that's when you really move into a competitor-free zone. Mm hmm when you realize that, you stop focusing on studios that are opening up around you and that sort of thing. Because you realize that people can only duplicate what they see. Right. They can't duplicate the why you do it, which is also why you can go to someone's class, like a Carmine, you can steal her prompts, and it falls flat. And your students are like, what the fuck are you talking about? Right. Meadows and, and freezing. What the fuck are you talking about? Yeah. Because it was never yours. Yeah. You didn't understand the why behind it. You didn't prep your students for it. You couldn't take them down the journey. All you did was replicate what you saw. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's so funny. Do you know what's even more funny? And actually, I now want to have Carmine on here because she now did. so much of what she has said in her post makes so much more sense. What we consider prompts in the UK would be the bodily sort of like cues I guess cues and prompts I don't I mean if anyone is listening to this from the UK and also confuses those words because I would not have had um that word association with being sort of like a storytelling method I would have had it as been like a prompt put your hand here put the arm here you know pull here and you know spin your body away from the pole that's kind of what I that when someone's like giving me my prompts that's my prompt so now I see what you mean okay god so now so yeah. much more about oh, pose makes sense too. because when she used to say about you know people are taking my prompts whether I'd be like yeah but we all got to use the same prompts hey <laughs> but but now I'm like oh fuck that's what she meant <laughs> oh yeah. my god yeah. but yeah so now yeah. it makes so much and more sense mm. so it happens a lot I'm just using Carmine but I could use anybody yeah Carmine's just at the top of my mind because I've worked with her before yeah um on her business stuff so she's at the top of my mind. Yeah. But um, it happens all the time. Yeah. It happens all the time. And do you, um, like, what made you choose to, talking about sort of like being in, because um, it is a very female dominated space. And obviously I was just talking about how it can get quite catty between like girls sometimes. And, you know, what made you choose to make your business sort of like a female um space so that it's just for women. Was there anything in particular or was it you just felt that you worked better with women or did you have any mm -hmm. experience coaching a guy who was like a complete asshole or something? Was there anything like that that happened or no, no. So for me, I am a womanist in terms of my <laughs> stance in life. Uh -huh. Um so for me, it is all about the female voice because the female voice is an oppressed voice that I am very familiar with. Yeah. Like I said at the beginning of this, I understand patriarchy at a visceral level. Mm -hmm. And so I know the impact that that has on women. So when women are fighting with each other or women are doing these sorts of things and men might say, well, that's being catty. But when you don't have enough resources it builds its survival. Right. And so a lot of what I see in female dominant industries is patriarchal conditioning. Mm -hmm. It mm -hmm. is a response to survival. It's a, res it's a survival response. Even like, let's talk about everybody being the same. And I had to have a come to Jesus meeting about that myself. Mm -hmm. Is that there's safety in sameness. Yeah. When you stick out, there's a Japanese or a Chinese proverb. There's an Asian proverb that says the nail that sticks out gets hammered down. Okay. And that is very prevalent in female dominant spaces. It's safety and sameness because when you stick out, someone's going to hammer you down. Mm -hmm. And a lot of women, I talked about this in a quick little reel I did the other day. The social conditioning around standing alone and social capital and being relational 
having that taken away from you is crippling. Mm -hmm. And I know women, they'll sit up and say, I don't give a fuck about what nobody says. Bitches, 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 bitches. <laughs> and then they go home and cry. Yeah, of course. It's got... Nobody likes me. And, and so it's a facade because everybody wants love and care. Of course. Even me as an Enneagram 8, because people think I'm that way, Dan. They think I'm like, I don't give a fuck what you want. I can meet you out in the parking lot. I can. I can and I will as long as my knees let me, okay? <laughs> but, but I care deeply about my reputation. I care deeply about how I'm perceived mm -hmm. because that's a part of my conditioning as a girl, right? as a woman. Okay. However, I've learned not to take it to heart. Yeah. It doesn't mean it doesn't hurt me. Mm -hmm. I just don't let it cripple me. Yeah. Some women aren't willing to take that chance. So what they'll do is, and people play off of this shit, Dan, all the time. And it's just crazy to me where they'll be talking about you behind your back. Right. But when they're at Polcon, Hey, Hey, hey Dan, how you doing? Bitch, did you just do a whole smear campaign on me on Instagram? <laughs> and now you want to force me to say hello because there's other people watching? Yeah. And has that happened to you before? Oh, yeah. People have tried it, but they don't try that shit anymore <laughs> because they know me. <laughs> they know me. I'm like, excuse me? <laughs> so what sort of like, well, I, I'm intrigued to know now. I was, It wasn't actually one of my questions, yeah. but more just I'm intrigued to know like what... What bad stuff can anyone, and I'm not just saying this to make you feel good, like, I don't ever see any of your stuff and I'm never offended by anything you say. Like, all of it is truth, really, isn't it? Like, so what is it that people want to talk shit about? Like, people are offended by the truth. People are offended by the truth. Do you feel and that, that's conditioning. do you feel like as well that people are offended by success and people don't like that you are um, happy and owning your success? Do you feel that that's anything to do with it? Um, possibly. I think it's a small thing. Um, I think it's bigger for them is because when we talk about social conditioning of women, women are to be quiet. Women are to be seen and not heard. Yeah. This is patriarchal conditioning. It is unladylike to be loud. It's unladylike to confront someone on their lies. You smile and say, bless your heart, like they do in the South, right? Like it's unladylike to cuss somebody out. It's unladylike to stand for what you do. Like that's all patriarchal, patriarchal conditioning. Mm. I don't do any of that. You still, for me, I can tell you, Dan, and I won't go into it now, but I've heard of people stealing money from people. Okay. Right. I just heard a story three weeks ago and I'm like, why the fuck haven't y'all blasted this person all over the internet? You steal a dollar from me, Dan, the world gonna know it. Yeah. I you would not be going around still doing things. Think about the scandal that happened with the photographer who was supposedly, you know, molesting women in spaces and it was not discussed. That's conditioning. Yeah. That's harmful to us. But so I think people don't like the fact that I just speak up and tell the truth because they don't have the courage to do it. Right. I think that's a major thing. And then they don't like my style. My style is very direct. It's very hood. It's very like. I like that though. Me. I think that's what I like about it. It's very unique. But it's not. Do you know what? I think it's uh, sometimes. Uh, this is where obviously I think I relate with you so much. And this is why obviously I've been cancelled in the past or people have tried to come for me is because I am very direct. And I am going to tell people if I don't think something is right. And I will, you know, and, and I'm also very happy to apologize as well. Like whenever I've made mistakes, I'm always happy to apologize. And I think that's super important for, for a person like me, especially the type of person that wants to, you know, if I see something, I'm like, no, I don't like that. And I'm going to say something about it. You know, I also will, if they then come back to me and say, well, actually, this is why I'll be like, oh, actually, I apologize. I take it back. Do you know what I mean? I'm happy to do so. But people really don't like that because like you said, it's that whole conditioning. People are conditioned to be like, no, you you can't call them out for, for stealing money. How you, you have no proof they stole money. Well, yeah, I do. I've, I've got the proof right here. Yeah, but, you know, do you have receipts? Well, no, I don't have receipts. I'm telling you. And they're like, yeah, but that's not enough. I'm like, well, it is fucking enough because I just fucking told you they stole money from me. It's And then, and then you'll post about it online, you'll be like, you're damaging their reputation, where are the receipts? I'm like, I am telling you. Do you know what I mean? It's that whole thing, I, I think that's crazy. I'm like, are you crazy? 
and this is but this is what we're dealing with on the internet though this is this is what we're up against it's, it's madness really you can call people out for the craziest of shit and people will be like oh think about their mental health think about their mental health honey she just stole money from me i, I need to pay my goddamn bills like what the fuck do you know what i mean it's what <laughs> happens to us i don't understand like it's crazy so but now i don't know whether you do the same sometimes i really want to be like i'll see a situation i'll be like damn like that is crazy and i'll be like in a in another another dan rosen a different dan rosen from five years ago he might have said something about this but now i'm just like i'm just gonna take a step back because this will not end nicely for me and i'm just like i'm just gonna leave it but it's one of those things i just think i speak up i speak up when it makes sense for me to speak up yeah right i got drug probably i don't know probably four months ago you got what sorry because i i got drug on the internet they had tagged me all over the place it was insane people were going off they were calling my dead mother a pimp like they were going off like it was insane oh my god um because i said oh and it was International Women's Day. So that was March is when it happened. Right. Um, I spoke up against Pole Studios charging extremely cheap prices for their classes and then telling women that they should invest in themselves. I said, and I mean, and I'm still saying it now, that when we pay more for things inherently, we appreciate them. More. Of course. When you offer super cheap classes, you're reaffirming the narrative that your pleasure, that a woman's development should always be cheap, should always be the last thing on the totem pole, should always be this base level. Mm. It reaffirms that narrative. Yeah. People took that as me saying that you should basically rape people and take all this money from people and and the part that was left out of the conversation and every time I would try and engage on that is what is the transformation that's being provided? You're calling me a pimp. You're calling me a money grubbing studio owner. You're calling me Cruella DeVille. You're calling me all these things. But the part you left out is if the transformation happens, is it a ripoff? A ripoff is when you're charging someone something and there's no value. Yeah. If a woman leaves a toxic marriage of 20 years based off of your coaching and your guidance and you charge them $35 a class to help them through that process, is that pimping them? Yeah. <laughs> Crazy. But do you, do you think as well, like the whole... See, I, I think it's that whole difference between there is a difference between charging your worth and overcharging. You probably weren't telling them to overcharge. You were telling them to charge what it's worth and charge a reasonable amount. You know, sometimes, especially when you see like when studios put their studios on like Groupon. Do you have that over in the US? Groupon? Yeah, we used to. It's kind of died okay. down here. Yeah, but but we... like, again, the Groupon thing. You know, if you if you offer someone, this is the issue as well. So if you offer someone something too cheap, they then the people that you're going to get are not the people that are going to want to stay. <laughs> you know, that's not the customer that's going to stay because they're not going to pay your real prices. And this is the problem is that it might be great short term, but it's not great long term for your business. It just makes no sense. And people argued with me they because some people think you can't do math and that's OK. I'm not here to argue with people about top line ve revenue versus actual profit. Mm -hmm. That ain't my gig. But there were people who came after me who stood up for their low cost classes and said that that was profitable and it worked for them. And I'm just like, I can do math. <coughs> Excuse me. And maybe I've had to learn Dan. So this is what I'll say. I've had to learn that not everybody wants to be profitable to the degree that profitable is subjective. Yeah. Because technically, if you make $1 over your expenses, you're profitable. Right. Math-wise, if you make $1 <laughs> revenue minus expenses, if there's $1 left over, you're technically profitable. Right. My point is, so I've had to rearrange my marketing message in this industry 
to say my goal is for every studio owner to make between a hundred and a hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year mm -hmm. off of their studio. Yeah. So now you go back and you do your math, your damn self. Yeah. And if you can make that work off of cheap classes, God bless you. But you can't. No. You can't. And so now I tell people, my goal is for you to make one hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year off of a one room studio. Mm -hmm. That's my goal. Right. Then the sky's the limit. If you want to open different locations, if you want to do online programming, if you want to do licensing, if you want to do franchise, the sky's the limit. Yeah. But my role is to get you taking home 150000 making sure that that one studio you have is packed out, extremely profitable, and then it opens up options for you to do other things. Yeah. And yeah, yeah I mean, it just, I love that um, obviously you talk so much about the actual money. And I know I keep like, obviously we were going to talk a lot about money anyway, because that's what you do. But I like that you say to them, listen, my job is to try and get you this amount. Whereas I feel like no studios ever really talk about how much money they make or that they've had a great year or, and do you feel, you know why? Well, go on. I want to know why you think. No, what you well, say? Do I, I feel what? I wonder whether it's because they don't want their students to hear that they've done this, and then their students think I'm going to do that too, and then they go and open a studio down the road. Do you think the same or? Yeah, I think that's definitely a part of it, right? Um, because of conditioning, going back to patriarchal conditioning that mm -hmm. women shouldn't make any money. There was a thing. There was somebody, and I'm not going to say her name, but there was somebody who I went to dinner with in LA probably about seven years ago. She runs a very profitable business in our industry. That's all I'm going to say. And we started dinner and we start talking about money because that's what I do. When I show up, we're going to talk about business. Do you own a business? We're going to talk about money. And she started with the I don't really make a whole lot of money off of this as she picked me up in her S-Class Mercedes, by the way. <laughs> but I don't make any money off of this. I do this for the love of pole. Oh, I hate when people say that. Oh, don't get me started on that one. I hate it when people say that. I'm like, come on. Like, I love pole too, but I also like paying my bills and having money to go on holidays. You know what I mean? Like, let's not be around but the do bush. Do you understand? But this is the problem, though. This is why a studio owner can't celebrate her, their success. Mm. It's because the narrative is, I'm just a struggling artist. And in this community, it becomes punitive when you make money. So you could have someone who's doing very well, who's afraid to say it. Yeah. Because now people will want to take resources from them. Mm -hmm. Like you said, it could be open in another studio or it could just be this bitch don't need the money. I ain't going to pay my membership this month. Yeah. It's that crabs in a barrel kind of mentality. Yeah. Right. Um, but when we, so I understand them not wanting to do it on Instagram live. I would have never done that when I owned a studio. I would never go on and be like, oh yeah, we made $400,000. Of course. I, I think there's a difference, isn't there? It's a whole difference between like celebrating your success and, you know, being happy about it and feel like if someone asked you about it or, you know, like for example, when you were at dinner with her saying, well, yeah, it's been, it's been a good, you don't have to say, oh yeah, I made 500,000 this year. I'm rolling in money. Oh, you absolutely but you could. But you could. And, and there shouldn't be anything it. wrong with it. Hey, babe. Sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to quickly come on and tell you about one of our podcast sponsors. This podcast is sponsored by Grip and Glow. Grip and Glow is one of my favorite products. And I'm not just saying that. I truly use this product all the time. This is great for people who actually suffer with dry skin. It gives you that nice sticky feeling. So, you know, when you're on like a summer's day and your skin feels super sticky and so grippy, like leg hangs are an absolute dream, this product will give you that grip any time of year. So it's an amazing product. I actually personally like to put a bit of dry hands or a similar product onto my legs first and then spray this on top. Oh, it makes them perfect, like nice and tacky, perfect. So go and check out Grip and Glow and you can actually use my offer code POLOLS10 to get 10% off all your purchases on their website. So go and check out Griffin Black. The reason I started the society four years ago was because I knew studio owners needed a place to have these conversations. 
yeah. so that they could really meet their goals. Like you said, to pay their freaking bills. And yeah. there are tons of Facebook groups out there. So just like I ask, what I what are you bringing to the market that's different? I asked myself that before I started the society, which has now turned into the collective. What are you going to bring that they can't get in a free Facebook group? And the mm-hmm. first thing I brought was vetted community. No one can get into the collective unless you're vetted. So right. if there's been problems with other studio owners, you can't come in. Because right. I'm not going to have that type of space there. Because we're going to talk about our numbers. And you might yeah. not be comfortable talking about your numbers when your competitor is sitting there. But here's the funny thing, Dan. Inside of my collective, I've had four of my competitors be my clients. Right. Because I don't give a fuck. Like, yeah, well, it was it was important to me that they got that value piece right. Mm-hmm. Because when you get that, we're no longer competitors. We're just post studios in the same area. That was what I was just about to say. I was going to say, like, surely, especially based on the model that you try to teach people, it shouldn't really matter. It's like, yeah, it's just completely different business models, isn't it? Yes. And I'm like, so that's why I want you to come in. Yeah. In addition, I'm getting your money. Two, that's nice, but it was more important that now we're all very distinct brands. And so we can only serve certain clients and that makes it better for everybody. Right. So I really do think that this fear of talking about money is what you said, that resources will be taken away from me. Mm -hmm. And this community that I put in air quotes it's it's interesting it's an interesting thing and and this narrative that everything should be cheap everything should be communal everything should be free yeah you should be struggling why would you want and this is what i said to the people who were dragging me the students or whatever i said if you love the studio so much you're on here you're you fucking going to the wall for the studio right now if you love them so much why would you want them to live a better lifestyle if what they, they say? Think fucking crickets. <laughs> or they would retort back with their financial situation. Or I can't afford to pay more than $10 a class. But you just told me that this woman, you're literally writing for her all on my page right now, changed your life. So that life change was only worth $10? Get the fuck out of here. Yeah. It's a... <laughs> You know, we're in an industry as well where what we do is, it's like yoga. It's it's not going to be the cheap spin class or whatever at your local gym. It's different. This requires like different sets of skills. This isn't something anyone can just pick up and teach necessarily. But it's, yeah, people are devaluing it. And the difficulty, I mean, back when I first started pole, pole was way more expensive than it is now. Like it was mm-hmm. so much more expensive because... You know, there was a lot less of it. And because there was less of it, it made it a lot more sought after. So more people were willing to pay more money for it. I mean, I remember doing a workshop with Felix Kane um, years ago. And we paid, I think it was like £100 for two hours. You would never get that now. You just, and loads of us paid it because we just wanted to learn from Felix. And, you know, we, you'd never be able to charge that now because it's just been devalued so much by people coming in and charging less. And then someone else coming in and charging less and undercutting each other. And it's, it's sad because it does make me think, oh, God, like, at what point do we stop? But actually, and this does kind of actually segue into the next part, because um, obviously we've just we've just gotten through a pandemic. We are, well, especially in the UK, we are heavily steaming towards a financial crisis here. I don't know what it's like in the US, but I think it'll probably be similar. Um, so the cost of living here has just gone, it's gone sky high. It's crazy. I mean, to give you an idea, it was like, you know, £65-ish to fill up my car. It's now way over £100 to fill up my car. You know, our electric bills have gone up. Our mortgage has gone up. So everything is just so much more expensive. So so many, I've lost students to it already. Um, mm-hmm. What is your advice, you know, for people who, especially the ones who want to make their classes super cheap, like what are your advice, what's your advice to studio owners and to people, even just people running their businesses on what to do really to prepare now for what's to come? Because I don't even think we're in the start of it yet. (laughs) Well, I think we've been in it um, for two years for sure. Oh, you think? Before the pandemic. Yeah, I actually recorded an episode back in 2019 about preparing for the recession. 
because right. there was all types of financial markers that the average person is not looking at that a bubble has to burst. It doesn't yeah. just keep expanding. So I actually recorded a podcast back in 2019 about how to prepare for a recession. Didn't know we were going to have a global pandemic the next year that would <laughs> make it, you know, no Even one knew worse. that. Right? So here we are. And so to answer your question is, one of the mistakes that I made early on in my business that had me damn near bankrupt was thinking that you could play the quantity game because that's the game you're playing when you have cheap prices for your classes. You're saying, I'll make this money up by the volume of people that come in. It's quantity versus quality. In a recession, there's two things that I want people to hear me say. There are always people with money, even in a recession. Yeah. But people with money get more particular about who they give that money to in a recession. So the best way for a business to survive and even thrive in a recession is to make sure that the service you offer is premium. It's back what I said before. You cannot sell on technical skills. That's what... Felix was selling on then because nobody was doing spatchcocks. Right. Like that, that was a technical skill that could be taught. What devalued it wasn't a bunch of people opening per se. It was everybody can teach that. When you market on technical skills, because this is a podcast for our industry, when you market on technical skills, that will turn you into a commodity. You will have to charge cheap prices because someone's going to charge a cheaper price. Right. But when you amp up the IP, the intellectual property, when you amp up the experience itself, people will start to say, I'm going to spend money there because that experience is rich, is deep. Right. It's transformative. That's why it makes you feel... Abundant. Of course. I mean, if you're going to a a class and you enjoy it so much that you can't imagine your week without it, you're not going to give it up, even if you're struggling a little bit for money, are you? But if your service is not good enough that people are willing and don't get me wrong obviously there is a limit to that (laughs) obviously some people physically just will not be able to afford it and that's obviously a sad situation but you know I feel like a lot of people obviously will be in a situation where they have to make their choices whether it be you know am I gonna have my nails done this month or am I gonna go to pole class which one makes me feel better well if pole class makes you feel better than getting your nails done then that might be the choice they make and I guess yeah I totally I love the way you describe it like that like the experience and what they're kind of experiencing when they're with you I love that what when it's an experience when it's a premium experience when it's an an abundant experience you have Mm. abundant clients But and what I want people to hear and say, I'm not saying if you do cheap classes that your classes are trash. I'm not saying that. I'm saying you're undervaluing the transformation that you're providing. And if you undervalue it, your customers are going to undervalue it. And what happens is when you charge an when you have an okay experience, people can live with that or live without it. But Mm. when it's truly transformative, when it's luxurious, when it's abundant. People are like, I'm going to forego getting my nails done yeah, because I want to spend time with Dan this week. Like, because when I'm in this space, it, it, it charges me up so that I can go out and be who I need to be in the world. Yeah. That is the types of experience that premium brands get. I just stayed at a hotel. I'll end it with this. So I went to see my clients in Atlanta and, um, Sure, Hilton, Marriott's, they're all very nice hotels. But when I travel, I stay in five-star hotels, period. That's what I do. It's luxurious. It's abundant feeling to me. She's a bougie diva, I see. I am. I'm a bougie bitch. (laughs) But let me tell you why. It helps my business, though. So I'm getting ready to recommend this to your listeners. Mm -hmm. Get in premium experiences. So you can see what they're doing and what can be replicated. Hmm. 
rich people, and I'm not rich, but I'm 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 not wealthy. That's what I should say. I'm not wealthy. Wealthy people have different expectations. And so I often like to put myself in the presence of wealthy people. Mm -hmm. And what can I learn about the customer service that I got that I can bring back to my pole dance studio? What can I learn by staying at St. Regis that could help me in my pole studio? Do you know what it is? Premium experience is all about the little touches, Dan. Yeah. It's the little touches. Mm -hmm. I could stay because St. Regis is owned by Marriott. Okay. So I could go to a Marriott courtyard or I could stay at the St. Regis. They're owned by the same parent company. So what's Mm -hmm. the difference between a courtyard and St. Regis? It's the little touches. I've stayed at the courtyard. I used to travel when I had a corporate sales job all the time. Courtyard was our corporate account. That's where I stayed. If I forgot my toothpaste... They would absolutely bring me toothpaste, but they were going to bring me a a tube of toothpaste. Here you go. This is what you asked for. Thanks. Mm -hmm. St. Regis, I don't have toothpaste. They bring me this beautifully packaged gift. (laughs) They'll brush your teeth for you. (laughs) (laughs) But it's beautifully packaged. You know, it's in St. Regis bag. Like, that's a small thing that costs Mm. them absolutely nothing to get same brand same parent company Mm. but it made me feel abundant it makes you feel luxurious it's little stuff so i want the studio owner listening to this and saying in this recession how am i going to make my experience more premium more luxurious more abundant it's little shit that don't even cost you a whole lot i have a question um you were just saying about obviously when you go to these hotels it's good for you to go to them and experience it so that you can take away those little things and bring that to your business. And I love that idea. So what I want to know is if I go on like a five star holiday and I do bring some of those bits back to my business, can I expense that against my business? Of course. (laughs) Because I think that should totally be allowed. (laughs) Of course. Yeah, because you know, I, I definitely go, so I am going on a holiday in October. I'm going on a cruise, but no, I'm not on a holiday. I am there to, I just want to test out and see what experiences I can bring back to my business. So I feel I should be able to put that whole holiday through the business. Now you're telling me disagree. Yeah. Um. <laughs> my, I'm going to, I'm going to sell it to, no, cause you're selling it to me. I think if I can sell it the way that you just did, my accountant might buy that. <laughs> Well, just see a client, see a client while you're there, you know, talk to a prospective client, right? It's 50%. So it's not the whole thing. It's 50% that I'm able to write off, right? For doing that. But for me, it's not even about the write off because Dan, and I know you do well as well. We're beyond the stage where write offs help us. (laughs) We need tax shelters. Like seriously, we need what Donald Trump has. Like we need Elon Musk strategies. I know. Who do we call? Like who does he call? By the way, I would like. You know when people are like, oh, you know, why don't you? Why don't you just get an offshore account? I'm like, honey, do you even know like how to tell me how you do that? Like, go on then, you tell me. I'm like, that's not something you just hi offshore accounts. I just want to get one. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> what are you talking about? People well, are so about crazy. Um, I am absolutely looking for a wealth manager who does know about offshore accounts. I'll share something <laughs> offline. Um, but seriously, in all truthfulness, when we talk about write-offs at this stage of our business, that doesn't mm. even really help us to be no. candid. It's like, you're still going to owe an excessive tax burden. It chokes me how much I pay in taxes. It makes me so sad. (laughs) Paying it is the saddest thing. Do you know what? That's the thing. That's the one thing I do miss actually about having a normal job, like a wage job, is that the money that went into my account, that was all mine. That was all my money. And I didn't even look at the bit where it said how much I'd made before that point because I didn't want to look. And it was that whole thing of like, now I have to see it in my account. It's there. I could spend it if I wanted to. I really could, but I'd get in a lot of trouble. And it's that whole thing. Right? And then when you send it away, you're like, wow. I, and you know when you work so hard for something, do you know what I mean? You're just like, oh, God, that sucks. But, hey, that's business ownership, I guess. But you know what? Is, right? And people are like, 
my coach is like, well, think of it, change your mindset about, think about how much money you had to make to pay that. And I'm like, that's, that's what my accountant says to me. She's like, yeah, but Dan, she's like, if you had to pay a lot of tax, it means that you made a lot of money. I'm like, that doesn't make me feel any better. <laughs> but uh, do you know what as well though? One thing I would say as a business owner that I have learned is, um, cause I, basically like when I, when the pandemic happened and I started my online business and stuff, my businesses all changed. And I just did not prep for it at all. And I wish I'd, I'd sought like financial advice sooner. So mm-hmm. any studio owners out there who haven't had financial advice, I honestly, I strongly, strongly recommend it because it was the best thing ever for me um, because yes. it meant I could manage my finances so much better. I was like, why am I paying so much tax? And then my financial advisor was like, right, we need to be doing this. You need to be doing this. You need to be having this over here and this over here and That's this. Right this business here this i was like oh wow okay i didn't even realize that so much of this was possible all legal by the way but none of this Mm -hmm. is legal but Mm -hmm. i mean it's just tax efficiency right right it's tax planning right it's like the difference between earned income and distributions right that that one thing if nothing else your listeners take away go research that go ask a question about that because earned income is what you're being taxed on Hmm. distributions that's a whole nother conversation yeah but they need to seek out financial advice to do that but even with these things we do still have large tax burdens of course i still of course we still have to pay large amounts of tax it's still crazy but i actually realized it wasn't until after all this and i sought financial advice i was actually doing so much of it wrong and i wasn't Mm -hmm. there was things that i didn't realize that i could be claiming for that i wasn't putting through as my expenses and they're like why are you not expensing that i was like well i didn't do do you know what for a long period of time and like if you're an instructor listening to this or you're a poll dancer who does it for work like I didn't realize for so long that you could put your workshops through. And now I tell this to everyone. I'm like, babe, you, you can put your workshops through your business, right? And they're like, no, I'm like, yeah, you can. It's, this is, this is your training. Like this is your, mm-hmm. this is your continuous professional development. Mm-hmm. And I didn't realize that for so long. So obviously when I did, I was like, oh my God, yeah, I have to put, I have to put all this through. Cause this is just crazy how I didn't even know that. But that's why, again, I saw that advice. And now I'm and you don't know what, position. you don't know what we don't know. Right. Which is, again, another reason why we need to put ourselves in wealthy circles, Mm -hmm. because they the conversation is different. Uh I didn't know what a fucking capital gain was when I wanted to start looking into selling bombshell. Mm -hmm. Like every time I would propose a way to sell it, my business broker would be like, and the capital gains on that would be da da da. I'm like, what the fuck? Like, I would have never thought of that. And I would have sold my business without that knowledge. And would have got hit with a huge tax bill. Right. Almost 50% of the sales price. <laughs> wow. This is what we're talking about. We're talking about, so that's another reason to kind of wrap it up is when we're talking about pricing, people don't recognize that. Like the tax that's on some of this, mm. we're not just taking $500,000 and putting that in your pocket. No. No. That's not what people understand, but I ain't got time to explain that to a pole dance student. No, but that's but this is the problem is that that they only see the five hundred, so that's what they see. They're like, oh, she sold it for five hundred. Wow, she must be rolling in it. Yeah, don't forget to take away all my expenses. Don't forget to take away my tax, which is ridiculous. But yeah, and this is one of those things. Like, uh, and I think not all students do do it. I think you know some students do. You know how it is. Like a student will look in the class mm-hmm. and be like, okay, we're, we're all paying $20 here. Oh, yeah, they do the math. They, were, they do the math. And it's like, yeah, but you haven't really done the math. That's the problem. <laughs> so you've done and the so math, And so that's why studio haven't. owners need that. Studio mm-hmm. owners need a space to talk about these sorts of things. Because talking about it to your students or even to your staff is not the space for that. So when I started the collective, I wanted to have what I call a very brave space. So we talk about our numbers very candidly. We're not in there lying to each other because in a lot of these Facebook groups, folks just be flat out lying to y'all, period, (laughs) about what they're making, how they're doing. I've seen it. Yeah. And in our studio, in our collective, we show our numbers. We do screenshots. Like we're not playing. Yeah. Because it keeps us all accountable to growth. Of course. And I it's so that. important that we have a space as studio owners because the internet's not your space. No. It, they're, they're not going to understand. And you trying to argue with people about anything over the internet 
is a waste of your energy. 100%. So my goal is let us all start making real money. Let's talk about it. Let let it be an expectation. And if you feel like you're robbing your students, maybe it is because you are. Right. If you yeah. feel like you charge more, you would be robbing them because you know the service you provide. I don't. Yeah, I agree with you 100%. Um, you talk about this collective and just to kind of wrap this up because it is almost mm-hmm. an hour and a half. I could talk to you for hours. I know. I love, I love listening to you. I just love everything that you do. And obviously I follow all your social media posts and I'm always checking out your content. But oh, so you talk you. about this collective. How can people um, get in contact with you? How can they become part of the collective? How can they work with you? What is, give them all the info they need to, to find you. Where can they find you? Yeah, absolutely. So if you're a pole dance studio owner currently, I would say follow me on Instagram at Million Dollar Pole Studio. It is a private page because I fence the table because of the conversation. I do not want instructors and students even seeing what we're talking about on our Instagram lives because they don't get it. <laughs> yeah, They can follow me there. Um, and then if you want to work with me, there are two ways that you can work with me. When I talk about those soulful value sessions, and for your listeners, I'm going to honor this price because the price is going up. But essentially, it's a 90-minute session where I help you to mine out who you are and what makes you different. And that's the foundation for your marketing. Mm -hmm. $333 for 90 minutes is going up to $555 today. But when this airs, Mm-hmm. It won't be. It'll be past that. So I'm going to honor that. But they have to tell me that they heard me on the day. Okay. Meeting. So, okay. Me- yeah, mention that you were listening to the podcast, people, and then she will sort you, she will sort you out for me. Yes. <laughs> they have to tell me they were on the weekly D. Yeah. That's the only way that I'll okay. honor that. Perfect. Place. Perfect. Okay. And then the second way is for studios that are established, but they're having a tough time getting students to convert from their intro offer. Mm -hmm. into long-term memberships, which is the absolute health of a studio. Yeah. It's called Intros That Convert. It's a five-week program. Those are the only two ways that you can work with me initially. The collective is invitation only at this point um, because I have to make sure that you're about that life. Like, (laughs) I have to make sure that your studio is a premium level studio because one of the things I made a mistake on is when I first started this, I let any studio in there. And Dan, I was embarrassed. This was my fault. This was on me. But I was telling people, you know, raise your prices because I assumed everybody had a transformative experience. That was my fault. I assumed that. I also assumed that everybody took pride in their studio. I got $4,000 chandeliers hanging up in my studios. Like, it's, it's a nice space. These people had holes in their walls. And I'm sitting here talking to you about raising your prices, but you haven't mopped your floors in five weeks. You know, like you got holes in your walls. Like, so I had to learn like, okay, not everybody is at the level to even have this conversation. So that collective experience is reserved for studios who are doing premium branding, who are offering premium expense uh, experiences. Like I think some of my most popular studios that work with me are like butter and felt. Mia, um, Minx and Muse. These mm-hmm. are brands that are extremely unique, extremely premium level, extremely like they offer classes, they sell out in hours. Right. You know, like waitlisted. Those are the types of clients that are invited into the collective. I love that. Well, yeah. for anyone listening, obviously you can mention the podcast and uh, you will be sorted out by Leslie, of course. But yeah, thank you so much for uh, coming on. Can you just tell people what your socials are so they can find you on the socials? What was the socials again? It was the yeah. There so was the million it's... dollar pole studio. That was the uh-huh. private group. And, then... and what about people Leslie who just want to follow all your TikTok videos and stuff that you do? Because I love those. All your reels that you do. They make me laugh so much. I love them. Oh, thank you. That's a compliment coming from the entertainer himself okay i love your reels i'm like yes she's done another reel like what's it about today (laughs) i love it but leslie d lyons is my page that i talk about general sales and leadership on yeah my website leslie d lyons and my pole studio one is six figure pole nice 
Thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming on. I li like I said, I could have talked to you for ages, but we'll definitely have to do another one sometime in the future. But until next time, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, Dan. You're doing great work, work in the world. I love oh, you. I appreciate you. Love you. Bye. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you really enjoyed this episode. And if you did, make sure you give it a like and subscribe to the channel so you can keep up to date on all the upcoming episodes. Until next time. That was all the tea that you can get this week. Join me next time right here. It's the week.